The title of my message is Parable of the Sun that was found. You may be thinking, where was it uh, mentioned in the scripture? Parable of the lost son is there. Parable of the prodigal father is there. Also the same parable people call differently. But where do we find the parable of the son that was found? It is not literally written in the scripture as it is. But I do believe every scripture written in the script, uh, everything, every word written in the scripture is inspired by God. And definitely I believe the Holy Spirit was working with the authors to place various cards they have, the information cards or the scripture cards they have to put, to put them in a particular order. Sometimes we take scripture, a paragraph we take and we read it we don't try to interpret it according to its context. What is written before and what is written after. We just take those words and uh, be, be, make our own wild perspectives from those scriptures. But to find the right meaning of the scripture, it is always important to us read the, to read the scripture in its context. So I'm going to present a scripture reading it in its context. So as I, as I was reading, I came across uh, some kind of resemblance with uh, people who are found by Jesus. And I titled it as Parable of the Son that was found. I borrowed this uh, analogy from Dr. Steve McVay. Uh, and uh, I will share it as if it is mine. I imagine after I passing away from this world, I go to heaven. Because I put my faith in Jesus. And I'm so excited to see the face of Jesus. I'm walking towards the throne room. Throne room. I'm walking and walking. And my vision is becoming brighter and brighter. As, we are, as I was reaching towards the throne room, I could see a great light in front of me. Thousands of angels were worshipping the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm just looking around, walking on the golden path, was so very confident within myself and so very excited that I'm going to see my Jesus for whom I waited throughout my life. I was walking towards the throne. I could see the great majestic throne of God there. And as I was walking towards the throne, my heart was filled with fear and trembling. And I was slowly making my steps towards the throne. Suddenly, I could see a gentleman wearing white from top to bottom, whose hands were pierced and legs were pierced, and has seen me, smiling at me so very happily. He stretched his arms out and he was running towards me. And as soon as I saw him, I was also so excited. And I'm, I'm no, I know I'm very sure that is none other than my Jesus. As soon as I saw him, I too stretched my arms and was running towards him just like in the television commercials in slow motion. So as we are running towards him, he came towards me and we came very close and he just right passed by me and he fell on the fellow next to me, behind me and he helped him and said, Billy Graham, I'm so very excited to see you here. Yeah, definitely. Billy Graham deserves such a great uh, uh, welcome. He preached gospel to millions of people. What about me? Handful of people who came to faith. Billy Graham, Billy Graham led people to church. Hundreds and hundreds of churches were built. What about me? I'm still worshipping and leading, working with a small group of people who are committed to be with the Lord. Most of the, none of them were uh, came, none of them came to faith through my work. What have I done? Billy Graham deserves great appreciation and welcome. He was a great man of prayer. He knows the scripture from Genesis to, Genesis to Revelation. Me, hardly could remember 50 Bible verses. Many a times, we Christians, we do think that way. I am not spiritual as the other person is. 
I don't have the knowledge of scripture as the other person is. When somebody prays, they use such a terminology. I mesmerize, I mesmerize Louis hearing the, that words, you know, especially in the beginning of the uh, prayer. I never thought of such kind of words they use. And very consistent prayer. Correct, uh, bring, uh, noticing each and every minute details of people and praying. On the other hand, me, I forget people who asked me to pray for, pray for them last night. Sometimes we feel like this, isn't it? Sometimes we don't know where Book of Joshua is. It's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. And many a times we feel disappointed. We think others are stronger than us. Others are more spiritual than us. And uh, sometimes it can happen. If you know some scripture better than others, we may feel I know better than the person. I'm a senior member of this church or I'm a board member of this church. I'm part of pastoral team. I'm past, part of a speaking team. I'm part of uh, so-and-so ministry team. And this fellow has come just now. Okay. And we feel some kind of pride within that. We feel, isn't it? We, we feel that. Okay. I'm giving more to the church. Or I'm doing more work in the church. I, I felt that way. Just a few months ago, I felt uh, every morning coming too early to the church and setting up things and uh, the running the service. There was a point I felt tired and then I felt I'm doing more for the church. Then suddenly the two young kid, uh, young uh, young youngsters joined as Roshan and Chiki. Now they put my pride, uh, you know, they humbled my pride. <laughs> they're helping us out and Ravi, they're coming and working a lot for the church. Okay, there is a there is a possibility. All of us, we may feel proud, or we may feel lowly, comparing ourselves with others. Especially, we compare ourselves with others, looking at our works or looking at others' works. So, what I would like to do is, I would like to uh, speak about this particular topic only today, uh, which I am calling the parable of the son that was found. Okay, it is actually taken from Matthew. It is a continuous um, scripture from Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, uh, the children came to Jesus and uh, the disciples stopped them. Then Jesus said, kingdom of God belongs to the childlike people. And we think childlikeness means being honest, being uh, hum uh, humble and innocent and so many things. But in very simple, let me tell you, being like a child means being a consumer. Taking things that fathers has as mine. That's all. They won't earn. Those are not people who earn. Those are people who consume things. That's all. That is what childlike means. Why am I saying that? Because the, uh, the next examples and all, uh, which are followed by this scripture, they speak, they, they actually give meaning to what childlikeness is. The right after uh, Jesus said to the disciples, kingdom of God belongs to childlike people, then comes a rich young ruler to Jesus. You all know the incident very well. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And uh, Jesus looked at him and said, okay, so you want to earn the kingdom of God. You, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? He said, okay, what you do is you go and obey the commandments. This fellow said, yes, I'm obeying the commandments from my childhood. And then Jesus said, oh, if you are obeying the commandments from childhood, let me tell you, try this. Mm, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And you will be having uh, treasure in the kingdom of God. And that man was so rich, he found it very difficult to sell his property and give it to the poor. And then he left Jesus. Then Jesus made an interesting statement. You all know it very well. And the same thing is pictured on the screen. It is impossible for a rich man, sorry, it is very difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God than a camel pass through eye of a needle. Okay, so a camel passing through eye of a needle is easier than a rich man entering into kingdom of God. Many a times we think Jesus was talking about the rich people here. 
the rich people means we think they live lavishly they spend all their money in all kinds of indulgence and they will be living all sinful life but in that culture a rich man means a righteous man look at the commandments and the the especially deuteronomy chapter 28 what deuteronomy chapter 28 says if you obey my commandments you will be blessed materialistically in so and so manner so in that culture they used to believe if anybody is rich that means he is a righteous man he was obeying the commandments that is why god has blessed him very richly so a rich man means a righteous man that is the reason when jesus said it is difficult for a rich man enter uh into the kingdom of god than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle all the people who were standing there were astonished and peter asked then who shall enter if a rich man could not enter into kingdom of god who shall enter but today what do we say rich man if rich man could not enter in the, into the kingdom of god we say oh it is obvious rich people cannot enter if they 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 were astonished not because all the people which are surrounded by jesus were rich but because the rich man means righteous man if a righteous man could not enter into the kingdom of god then how i and you can enter if pastor dan could not enter into the kingdom of god definitely not ravi okay in such a way we compare ourselves right they were also thinking and they were surprised how they can enter then jesus said a statement saying it is impossible for man but all things are possible with god so we understand one thing very clearly from here that by our righteous work we cannot enter into the kingdom of god we can enter into kingdom of god by god's doing only then starts the interesting conversation then comes peter and he asks the question uh to he has the question to jesus uh that you can find uh, uh what's 27 yeah yeah this peter who who and who got opportunity to enter into the kingdom of god he is talking to jesus and said see jesus the rich man he could not leave everything that he has and he could not enter okay well, we we left everything that we have and we are following you what do we get that's what peter is peter was saying to uh, jesus for which jesus was very good he is not like me so he answered and said so jesus said to them assuredly i say to you that uh, in the in the regeneration when the son of man sits on the throne of his glory you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel and everyone who has left house or brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children or aunts for my name sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit the eternal life then comes the twist but many who are first will be last and the last first see isn't it quite interesting jesus uh, he 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 uses such a statements uh, which um, confuses to an extent <laughs> and but because he has very deep meaning within them he can directly say no 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 not like that peter but he says if you left out anything for my sake you will receive it 104 but let me tell you the first will be last the last will be first peter must be thinking i was the first person leaving everything i left my net and followed jesus so i will be given something okay then jesus said the first will be last the last first isn't it confusing quite interesting to see there okay but let let us look at this scripture this particular thing clearly which can which builds as a foundation for us to look at what we have read so here peter was thinking he left everything just like the rich man thought he was obeying the commandments can anybody obey all the commandments no because apostle paul said there is no one righteous not even one and he said there is no one who so if you fail to obey even a single small commandment you have broken entire law so if you said a single lie that means we have broken entire law so according to that this rich man said that i was obeying the commandments from my childhood is it true the answer is no 
no one can obey the commandments as apostle paul said if righteousness can come by the works of the law then christ died in vain so no one can obey the commandments of the law but people can think that they are obeying the commandments of the law so this rich man thought he was obeying the entire law or the commandments but in reality he was not similarly peter thought he left everything and followed jesus but he too did not leave everything and follow jesus did peter really leave his net and follow jesus what happened right after the resurrection peter john and went fishing where is his net <laughs> did peter leave every, all his family what about jesus going and healing his mother in law <laughs> right so, so here peter also was thinking that he well he left everything and followed jesus but in reality he too did not leave everything and followed jesus that is the very reason he had to deny jesus for three times if he left everything and followed jesus leaving uh, carry leaving everything and carrying his cross and following jesus why would he deny jesus for three times the reality is he too did not deny everything to follow jesus sometimes people say about uh, talk about this uh, parable and they say uh, we have to leave everything for jesus and follow and rich man could not do this you and i have to do it which pastors have ever left everything and followed jesus who taught this message which of the members have done this nobody it is not talking about leaving everything and following jesus in those terms okay so peter thought that that's why he said the first will be last last first peter you are thinking you are the first person who left everything and let me tell you the first will be last last first so um, nobody left everything uh, and followed jesus and it's so interesting to see peter asking these questions in spite of jesus saying in the statement it is impossible for man but possible with god he said it is impossible for you peter but peter did not understand he thinks it is still possible for me and and i have done it okay that's what he thought and uh, similarly many of us we may be uh, thinking that i have left everything for jesus and followed him i hear the testimonies people say i left my job and followed jesus okay sometimes i say oh i was searching for jesus everywhere i went to these that i went to this institution that institution uh, this priest that priest i went to baba the so many things i read so many books they say that they were searching for jesus what does the scripture say in romans chapter 3 there is no one righteous not even one there is no one who seek after god if there is not even one person seek after god from where this person who came who said that he sought after god and he found god and if that was the truth the scripture should be like you know jesus yeah, scripture says that he came to seek and found uh, seek and save the lost it is not the lost people find jesus lost people he is lost how can he be uh, how can he find something okay he himself is lost so somebody else have to come and find them so jesus is the one who came and found us so people who says i did these i did that for jesus they are just trying to show off people who truly found the grace of our lord jesus christ and saved by that they will be humbled within themselves and they say i'm it is no longer i but christ lives in me as paul says i mean paul says all that i have i count it i consider them as rubbish that's what a heart a truly transformed heart says all that i have i consider them as rubbish rather than saying i was an ias officer i left it for the sake of ministry brother what are we doing we spoke the word ministry one and we speak about all the other things 10 times so we should be careful what we are hearing and what we are thinking within ourselves if we still think that i left i suffered something for jesus and i did then we may, we are getting into trap we are we lost our focus from jesus and we are looking at ourselves instead of worshiping jesus we are exalting ourselves so we should be careful with that so here comes peter he was thinking he left everything and followed jesus and at the end we all know what happened peter had to deny jesus for 
three times. That's why Jesus, Jesus said the first will be last, the last first. Why am I taking this word again is because the next, two, next parable, it has the connection. Because Peter was thinking he's the first, Jesus gave another parable uh, that is in uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16, which we have already read. That is the reason I don't want to read. So we know this parable. There was a um, there was a man who has a vineyard. He went out in the morning to find laborers. He went six o'clock and he brought few people. He went nine o'clock. He brought few people. He went twelve o'clock. He brought few people. He and again he went to three o'clock and brought people. And he told these people, "Come and work in my vineyard. I will give each of you one denarius." In other words, he fixed the wages. He said he will give this amount of money. And then he went six o'clock and he brought few people who worked only for a few minutes. Okay. And um, uh, people who came in the morning and they were working whole day. And people who came in the evening, they just started working. And then the time was over and he started paying them back. And to each of them, he paid the same amount. Then comes these people who worked from morning till the evening. And they come and said, we were working from morning till evening. You have given us this only, this much only. And these people just came in the evening. They've hardly worked for half an hour. And you are giving equally to them also. Equally. It is not fair. That's what these people are thinking. They thought they will be given more because they worked more. In other words, their focus was completely on what they have done their focus was on works so that is what jesus is reminding to people the parable right before this it tells it's not by your works it is by grace of god it's not by your works it is by the work of god and right after that peter is asking i have left everything and followed you what will i get that's why he said this parable he gave everyone equally so they thought they will receive more uh, and much more because they worked more. And these people are representing the people who are found. Like the people in the church. And that's why I said uh, the, the ring, young ruler and then parable of uh, camel passing through eye of an angel and this parable of vineyard. These three, two, three things come together and they express in your, they, they create a new parable, which I'm calling the parable of the disciples or the people or the son that was found. These people, they found, sorry, they were found by Jesus. They entered the kingdom of God and they realized the grace of God and enter. And after entering into the kingdom of God, what are they doing? Again, they are going back to the box. We work more, we should get more. And isn't it happening amongst us? Isn't it happening uh, within us? Like, you know, we are comparing ourselves with each other. Don't we do? We compare with each other and say, I'm doing better than this person. I'm doing better than that person. And we think we will be given um, a great throne in the kingdom. And even have you heard people say, people, those who work more in the ministry will have a mansion People, those who work, have a small, work very little, have small hurt. Have you heard this analogy people say? Uh, they, they say a story like, you know, there was a poor lady and there was a rich man. Okay, both of them, they were in the church. They were faithful to the God, they were faithful to God. And this poor lady was cleaning the church every time and doing all sorts of work. And the rich man used to give big donations and used to think, I'm, I'm giving big donations. And both of them died. They entered into heaven just like Billy Graham and I did. Okay. So uh, they, they went there and the rich man was asking Jesus, Jesus, where is my mansion? I gave the million dollars. The other day I gave quarter million dollars. The other day I gave two million dollars. So where is my house? Where is my house? And Jesus took him and to, shown him a small hut. Then this fellow was so disappointed for these million dollars. This is what I got. And Jesus comes and takes the poor man. This man must be thinking, oh man, for million dollars itself, small but your poor lady might have given 100 rupees. He would be sleeping on the roads. And Jesus takes the oh, poor lady 
and uh, uh, she passes the hut, then passes a two bedroom house, then passes a three bedroom house, then passes a villa, then gives a big mansion, and this belongs to. Have you heard these stories? Yes, we do think about think in that terms. Those who worked more will earn more. Those who that that is true in this world. Those who work more will get more. Is not is not something that works in the kingdom of God. And those who work less will get less. That is not something works in the kingdom of God. It is not because it is not based upon what you do or I do. It is completely based upon what Christ has done in and through us. It's not about us, our work. That's why it said, uh, it is impossible for man, but all things are possible with God. It is, means it's all things are possible with the work of God. That's why Apostle Paul says, I do not have anything to boast about myself, but except what Christ has done through me. If you read Corinthians, he says that. So it is not about what you give, what you have done. And so what happens when we compare? Only two things happen. Number one, if we compare ourselves with others, either we'll be disappointed, discouraged, or we become pride. Both have no place in the kingdom of God. We are saved by grace and we are going to be survived also by grace and we are going to be sanctified also by grace. Have you heard this statement say you are justified by faith and you will be sanctified by your works. But the reality is we are justified by faith and we will be sanctified also by the same faith and grace in grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you may say this kind of message demotivates, demotivates people from working. You are saying those who work hard and much also will receive the equal amount. Those who work less also will receive the equal amount. What I would like to say is people who think this, they did not understand the grace of God at all. If we truly understand the grace of God, what we say, in spite of working all these things, we say it's all you, O oh Lord. You remember the parable Jesus said? The servant comes. When the servant comes, the master says, you cook food for me and let me eat and let me uh, let me sleep then. You go out. And the, what does the servant say? It's all your grace, O oh master. A person who truly understands the grace, he realizes it is not by my work. No matter what big we did, just imagine the kind of big works we did. Can we compare them with what Christ has done for us? No. So, a person truly understood the grace of God would never feel low because he did not work better than the other person or will not become proud because he worked better than the other person. So, in the kingdom of God, there is no comparison, there is no um, disappointment and there is no uh, pride. And we another thing that uh, discourage, I mean, distract us very much. That's what uh, about rewards. We are living this world. We are giving, uh, keep on given kind of um, uh, motivation. And they say that I have, you work hard, you will receive a crown in the kingdom of God, right? And but I would like to encourage you, my brethren, go take the book of uh, take the Bible, open the book of Revelation, and read all the crowns that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. And the crowns that Paul mentioned, all those crowns were talking about Jesus. Nothing else. Crown of righteousness. Who is righteousness? What is crown of righteousness? Nothing but Jesus. Crown of life. What is that? Nothing but Jesus. So every crown that is mentioned in the Bible, they are not talking some kind of hierarchy or some grades of positions we are going to get in the kingdom of God. But they are talking about embracing more and more of Jesus. Embracing the righteousness aspect of Jesus. Embracing life aspect of Jesus. So it is talking about those. It is not about hierarchy or grades. And a couple of more things I would like to bring to your notice and then we'd like to close. Um, we Many times we think sanctification is always about our works. And then that is why we say we are saved by grace and sanctified by works. But reality, we are saved by grace and sanctified also by grace. Because sanctification is not just about work. Sanctification is about the relationship with Jesus. What does the scripture say? Whoever believed in Jesus, he had given the right to become the children of God. After you become the children of God, what do you do? What is the purpose of becoming a child of God? Now, what is the purpose of getting into relationship? Nothing but fellowship. Knowing the other person. Am I right? 
So when if Christian salvation is relational, the sanctification also absolutely relational. So the sanctification is not just about good works and doing more work in the church, but sanctification is about exploring the depths of uh, love, love of Jesus, exploring the uh, depths of heart of Jesus and connecting to Jesus in very uh, intimate level and exploring, you know, how profound it is. That is what sanctification is all about. And the side product of it is good works and service. As the scripture said in the Titus chapter 2, verse 14, the grace of God which saved us, it makes us jealous to do good works. It makes us, uh, you know, uh, to, it, it teaches us to say no to lawlessness and makes us jealous to do all good works. That is a side product. But the main product, main procedure of the sanctification is not about that works. The main procedure of sanctification is connecting to Jesus into in, in a profound way, in, in a very intimate level. That is what sanctification is. Each and every day we will be growing in that. That's what uh, our work is. That's why scripture taught, uh, tells us, you know, grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Knowledge is about the intimate level of relation, fellowship and relationship it is talking about. So having said all this, I would like to say one thing that is, the grace of God, which we talk about, it is scandalous to people. They won't be able to accept it. They find it very difficult unless the Holy Spirit works. Let me tell you, unless the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, we won't be able to understand that my relationship with Jesus is not just about my religiosity, but it's about understanding his love and grace and growing in his knowledge. So it's not about what I have done. Yeah, it, karo, kami hota hai. You know, how much you do, it is less. That's why Apostle Paul says, all things I have, I consider them as rubbish. So if we are doing more for the Lord, we realize we will be, we'll be we realize, uh, sorry, as much as we understand the grace of God, we realize how less uh, our great work is. Okay, if you understand his grace, all our great work will become small. And so, and it's so, isn't it so crazy for us before we come to faith and the moment when we, we, are, say, we are being saved, we, we read the Isaiah, scripture from Isaiah, which says, All our righteous, righteous works are filthy rags in God's sight. And as soon as we come to faith and all in the church, we forget that verse. Okay, all our righteousness is filthy rags. And now, all, all our my clothes are washed in the blood of Jesus. Right? We speak all these words, but we totally forget what Isaiah said. Even after being saved, our works are filthy rags only in God's sight. That's why he's not saved by works. He saved us by his grace. That's why Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3. It is so interesting he, the kind of language he uses. You know, Corinthian church was the worst church. And he calls them as he writes, starts the church as saints. You know all the problems in the Corinthian church. Then he called them saints. And Galatian, church at Galatia, they were very religious. They were very, very uh, concerned to please God. And you know what he calls them? Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I wanted to. This only I wanted to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by works or works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Look at the language he uses. Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfected by flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? Indeed, it was in vain. You suffered many things in vain, and indeed it was in vain. All hard work you did. It is in vain and it is vain. That's what he says. Isn't it surprising? So we start with grace. Many a times we tend to turn towards our works. The filthy rags which we left before we were saved. And again we take them and put them on our clothes which are whitely washed in the blood of Jesus. 
So that is the parable of the son that was found. We do that. We should be careful. We should be. We should keep our focus on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So, in conclusion, what I would like to say is this: We are all equal. There is no senior member, no junior member. All members are equal. There is no kid, no gray-haired person. Of course, I'm I'm getting gray hair before I turn old. Okay, so no difference. There is no difference between the person who is a theologian and who did not learn the scripture yet, who just started reading. And there is no difference between the person who works so much in the church or the person who comes for the church. There is no person who gives thousands of dollars of donation and the person who gives whatever they have just like the old lady gave in the temple. So all are equal. We all are equal. We all are at the foot of Jesus Christ. We are saved and sanctified by the grace of God only. And uh, that's why one, impo one important thing I would like to, scripture I would like to uh, read for you, that is from Romans chapter 5, verse 9 to 10. Uh, we all think about how we were saved while we were sinners, how Christ saved us, you know. And uh, that's what read in, uh, we can see in Romans chapter 5, 8 to 10, 5 verse 8, it says, uh, God demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Then it says, much more than having now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We always focus on how we are reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus, by the death of Jesus. But don't forget that verse was not over there. It was not about just washing the filthy rags. It was not over there. And it says, because of the life of Jesus Christ, we shall be saved more. Which, which means, because of the life of Jesus in you and me, because of that relationship, we shall be saved more. It is not by our works again. It is not at all focused on works. It is completely on the relationship. That's what we should be able to understand. So what I would like to say is the grace of God, it humbles everyone. It humbles the son who was lost and it humbles the son who was found. So if we truly understand the grace of God, we understand, uh, we, uh, we will be humbled. And we stand in God's presence in humility. And uh, grace of God humbles us so that no one can boast, but only sur surprised by it. We can only surprise by the grace of God. That's why Jesus said, the first will be last, the last first. Jesus was not really saying in the line, there is a line and it, it was turned at the other side. The first will become, the last will become first. He wanted to tell only one thing. What you are thinking, it is not the way it is. That's what he is trying to say. You think I will be first? It's not that way. An interesting thing is, in 19, he says, the first will be the last, the last first. In twenty, chapter 20, he says, the last will be first, the first will be last. You may think, what is this? Probably, in the first uh, thing, you know, first time when he mentioned in Matthew 19, he was talking about the rich man and the self-righteous people there. And he said, the last, you people are thinking you are first, let me tell you, but the last people will be first. And here he is saying to the people who are already saved and we're focusing on their works. And here he is saying, uh, you will be last, the last people will be first. There is a little connection. And I, uh, I would like to ask you to think about it and explore. Okay. So grace of God, it humbles us it and it surprises us. And G and that is one of the main reasons. Even Jesus, being the son of God, he humbled himself. He can say he is the righteous person. He can boast about himself. Even at least in front of his disciples, right? His disciples are the at least in front of them he can boast. But he did not boast about himself in front of his disciples. But he took a cloth and water and he washed the disciples' feet. He humbled himself. So, the parable of the son that was found teaches us about humility depending on the grace of God. And the same thing Jesus 
have exemplified on the day and the night that he was crucified. I mean, he was arrested. The next day he was crucified. John chapter 13 says, he loved them from the beginning to the end. And he took a bowl of water and a cloth and became a servant. And he washed their feet. And he expressed the heart of servantship, the, humor, the heart of humility. He exemplified and then he led us towards communion. So Luke chapter 22, verse 17 to 20, it says, after watching the feet of the disciples, showing and teaching what humility is, being the God, did not take his position and uh, his glory for granted. He humbled himself and he washed their feet. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourself. For I say to you, for I say to you, will, uh, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after the supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in blood, which is shed for you. As we take part in the blood and body of Jesus Christ, which established the new covenant, the covenant of our salvation. Jesus, in his work acts, he has shown the kind of attitude we should be having as we come towards the table. Through his actions, he taught us to be humble. Through his actions, he taught us to treat the least as the great. He hum being the greatest among all men, he humbled himself and washed the feet of the disciples and taught us humility. As we partake into the kingdom of God, let us remember Jesus who suffered and died for us so that we may be the beneficiaries of God's grace and we may be saved by his blood and we may be saved much more by his life in us. So let us remember his love and the suffering and the covenant he made and the grace he lavished upon us through which we come to the throne of grace with all confidence. Let's pray. Father, this moment, we stand before you with the attitude of gratitude for all the manifold blessings that you showered upon our lives, Lord. Lord, there are times we may be spiritually proud. There are times we may feel that we are totally not acceptable in your sight. But Lord, remind us and strengthen us by your spirit that we may come to know and realize and every moment we may believe that it's not by works, but by your grace alone. We stand in your presence. We are accepted by your grace alone. And we are appreciated by your grace alone. And we have been we are living by your grace alone, Lord, by the life of Jesus within us. As we come to this table, as we partake in the blood and wine of Jesus, blood and body of Jesus, which is establishing the new covenant, I pray that you may grant us your grace so that we may be have we may live with the attitude of humility, where we focus more on you. None on our works, completely depending on your grace until your kingdom come. As you said, we will not eat of it until your kingdom come. We wait for your kingdom come. Until then, bless our hearts so that we may be humble in your presence and in the presence of others. Thank you so very much. Bless this wine and bless this bread and bless our souls as we participate in the communion. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.